We live in an age of deconstruction. Everything around us, the, the very societal structures that we once took for granted, even the, the stories we see in movies and on TV, the narrative we're told about our history, even the most basic building blocks of, of society and even humanity itself, truth, beauty, goodness, the family, sexuality, and gender, everything is being deconstructed. And yes, that even includes Christianity. The Western church today is replete with churches, leaders, individuals uh, at various points along that slippery slope into apostasy, such as affirming homosexuality, transgenderism, the social gospel, the prosperity gospel, cheap grace, easy believism. The strong men and the courageous, faithful leaders and teachers that gave shape and direction to the Western church in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, they're all but forgotten. The dominant evangelical leaders of the 20th and the early 21st centuries are dying off. Those that are coming up behind them are often caught up in petty squabbles and jockeying for position on the now vacant platform that they desire to inherit. They're more concerned with nitpicking theological minutia and policing other people's tone on social media while we the people are forced to pay lip service to reductionist and revisionist historical narratives and compromised doctrinal structures. Our nation, our culture, our government, and even our churches have never been more openly hostile to faithful biblical Christianity. Faithful Christianity that is lived out in all aspects of life, as indeed it must be, and as our Lord Jesus himself commanded. And instead, they are insisting that all who claim to follow Jesus must only do so privately, Silently, inoffensively, it must be extinguished. It must be neutered. It must be deconstructed. One of the most readily obvious examples of deconstruction is in the world of music. My personal background. In the 1980s and 1990s, CCM, or Contemporary Christian Music, became a, a massive juggernaut. It was a massively profitable and very influential industry. As a teenager, I myself listened to, and I loved, and I even aspired to enter that industry myself one day. But over the last quarter century or so, the vast majority of bands and musical artists that I loved and looked up to back then have, to one degree or another, deconstructed. Arguably at the vanguard of this deconstructionist movement is the lead singer of the band Cademan's Call, a man named Derek Webb. On Cademan Call's first album, back in 1997, Webb wrote a song with these lyrics, I can see Jesus hanging on the cross. He came looking for the lost. Love has come and it's giving me hope to carry on. I can hear Jesus saying, Father, forgive. What a thing he did. Love has come and it's giving me hope to carry on. Fast forward to 2023. On Webb's most recent solo album, he had one song called Boys Will Be Girls, featuring a guest vocal from a drag queen who calls himself Flamey Grant. Webb writes these lyrics. I heard Jesus loved and spent his life with those who were abandoned by proud and fearful men. So if a church won't celebrate you and love you, they're believing lies that can't save you or them. And on that same album, another song entitled God in Drag, Webb sings, You've heard it said, God gave up His only Son to suffer and die for what you've done. But I say unto you, you're beautiful and free, all wrapped up in righteous rags. Baby, you're like God in drag, dressed up like the real thing. To top it all off, Webb attended the 2023 Dove Awards, basically the Grammy Awards for Christian music, wearing a dress. It's easy to see things like that and to see the progression of people, influential people like Derek Webb and despair. It's easy to look at the state of the world, of our nation, of our churches, of our families, despair of hope for the future. What's going on? How do we get to this point? How did such a, a high profile and seemingly solid person like Derek Webb end up in such tragic rebellion, apostasy, deconstruction? 
Why are so many people, especially younger people, deconstructing? If all of our institutions that our ancestors built over generations now seem to be crumbling at, at, at light speed before our very eyes, what hope is there for the future? This question isn't unique to our times. The psalmist David wrote in Psalm 11, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? In the early stages of their deconstruction, when they were challenged and questioned by uh, Christians, Webb and others like him, they commonly responded by saying things like, oh, well, I was just asking questions that no one could answer. Well, no, that's not true because we have over 2,000 years of history providing answers to the questions. They just didn't like the answers they got because the answers they got to the questions they asked said, no, you can't continue in your sin. There is a limit, a boundary of what you can believe and do and still be considered a Christian. But Webb and others in those earlier days of deconstruction would also reply with this Latin phrase, semper reformanda which means always reforming. And what they were claiming by this is that they were simply continuing what Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and all the other reformers had begun more than 500 years ago. They were just contextualizing, quote-unquote, the Bible and the Gospel. They were rejecting the narrow and depressive shackles of the institutional church. Aren't we supposed to be always reforming? They said. The reformers, oh sure, they got the ball rolling, but they, even the reformers were limited by their own times and their own cultures and their own biases. But we live in modern times. We live in the current year, whatever that current year may happen to be. We have modern technology. We have knowledge and wisdom and education that the reformers could only dream of. And so the right thing to do is just to keep going, right? Always reforming. Beloved, I hope I don't have to point out to you that this is not only what, not what reforming means. It's not what the church is called to do. It's not what that phrase means. And to use the idea of reforming and claim the Reformation in this way is a slap in the face to the reformers of the past. It's a slap in the face to the generations of faithful Christians who have come since, not to mention a slap in the face to our Lord Jesus Christ Himself the one who came to earth, who humbled himself to death on a cross in order to seek and save the lost. Reformation and deconstruction are not the same thing. In fact, I would be, go so far as to say they are polar opposites. Now, it's important to note here this morning that by deconstruction, I'm not talking about people who are in the process of re-evaluating their previously held assumptions or their, their hermeneutical lenses. Remember, we've talked about that before. I'm not talking about people who are making their faith their own after simply assuming their parents' faith in the younger days of their lives. Or they're in the process of recovering the light of God's Word and the trust in the church after being deceived by manipulators or false teachers. All while doing any and all of these things with the bedrock assurance of Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected for sinners, the truth of the Gospel. These things are all good and important to do. We're all called and commanded to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, Philippians chapter 2. So when I'm talking about deconstruction this morning, I'm really talking about full-on apostasy. Not honest apostasy that says, I am no longer a Christian, but deceptive apostasy that is abandoning the Christian faith altogether, all while claiming to still be a Christian or under the guise of the Reformation. It's important to make this distinction between Reformation and Deconstruction, because that's the answer to that question. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The answer is semper reformanda. Always reforming. But of course, we have to use the right sense of that phrase. And the right sense of that phrase is the exact opposite what deconstructionists like Derek Webb claim. The full Latin phrase can be found on the front of your bulletins. Ecclesia reformata, semper reformanda est, secundum verbum dei. That means the reformed church is always reforming, or must always be reformed, according to the Word of God. 
The Reformed Church is always reforming according to God's Word. Now, this sounds like a Reformation slogan, right? It's in Latin. The Reformers had lots of Latin slogans they used, but this phrase is actually of much more recent origin. There's an occasional instances of it in smaller, shortened forms in various writings from the 19th century, but that phrase first came into its full state and its full popularity in the mid-20th century by the Swiss theologian Karl Barth. And if you know your theology, uh, or even if you don't, I do not recommend you go out and read Karl Barth. So what does this phrase mean? First of all, semper reformanda, and that full longer phrase that it's short for, it does not mean continuing to change simply for the sake of change. It doesn't mean accommodating God's Word to the culture. It doesn't mean keeping up with the times. It doesn't mean that we have to make sure we're on the right side of history doesn't mean making Christianity palatable to unrepentant sinners and those who would destroy Christianity. It doesn't mean recontextualizing God's clear commands about sin in order to simply assuage your own sense of guilt or that of your friends and loved ones. That's how the deconstructionists are using that phrase. By the way, if someone is leaving the faith and claims to be deconstructing with no sign of actually reforming, the first question you should ask is, who are you sleeping with? Nine times out of ten, that's the reason. That was the case for Derek Webb. But what this phrase, semper reformanda, what it does mean is simply that we are sinful human beings, even the very best of us as the people of God. We're still sinful, and our natural sinful tendency is to drift. To drift away from God, to drift away from God's Word, away from diligent obedience to Him, away from pursuing Christlikeness, away from constant vigilance against our own sinfulness both individually and in our institutions. And so because of that tendency, we must always be reforming. We must always be going back to the unshakable and unchanging foundation of God's Word. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. God's Word alone is the perfect mirror that displays the true state of our hearts, our souls, and our churches And so we must always, always be striving to bring all of our life and all of our doctrine into conformity with it and under its authority and the authority of its author. And that last phrase, that last part of that Latin phrase, secundum verbum dei, according to the Word of God, that is what makes all the difference. So what hope do we have for the future of the church? What hope do we have for our children? I have children. Looking at the future makes me anxious, to put it mildly sometimes. What hope do we have for them, for their children and their children? Semper reformanda, not changing for its own sake, not capitulating to the spirit of the age, but always returning, always reforming, doing what the reformers said and going ad fontes to the sources, developing an all-encompassing lifestyle of constantly returning to God's Word, constantly reforming according to it, continually renewing our commitment to sanctification, mortifying our own sins so that we may then effectively do what our Lord commanded us to do, to go and disciple all nations and teach them to obey Christ as Lord. That's our command. That's our charge. That's our commission from our Lord. It doesn't matter how bleak or deconstructed the world around us might look at the time. There was another time when things seemed pretty bleak, when the church was small and insignificant. Strong leaders of the past were dying out. The next generation was timid and fearful, uncertain. Please turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the book of 2 Timothy. It's Pew Bible, page 1181. In the year AD 64, there was a great fire that swept through the city of Rome, and the wicked emperor Nero needed a scapegoat. Christianity had been spreading like wildfire throughout the Roman Empire for more than 30 years, but Rome herself looked on Christians as a fanatical uh, Jewish cult, or atheists because they refused to acknowledge the Roman pantheon, and even as seditionists, as traitors to the emperor, because Christians insisted that Jesus, not Caesar, was Lord. So Nero began a a brutal and a systematic persecution of Christians within his empire under the pretense of blaming them for the fire in Rome. And within a couple of years, the most important leader of Christianity in the Roman Empire, the Apostle Paul, 
was arrested and sentenced to death. And as Paul sat in the Mamertine prison in Rome, he penned this letter, which is often called his last will and testament, his last letter to his young friend and protege, Timothy. Timothy had been training with Paul ever since they met in the city of Lystra. That's recorded for us in Acts chapter 16. Timothy's father was Greek, and his mother was a Jewish convert to Christianity. Timothy traveled around with Paul for quite some time. He's studying with him, learning from him, ministering with him. And for a while, Timothy was even the pastor of the church in Ephesus. And Paul often had to exhort Timothy not to be afraid. Timothy may have had a weak physical constitution as well. Remember, Paul instructed him to take a little wine for his stomach. But although the gospel had been spreading, it now was under direct attack for the first time from the mighty Roman Empire. Its primary leader had been imprisoned. All the rest of the apostles, very soon in the future, would be uh, executed as well, except for John. The next generation then didn't, had no clear idea how they were supposed to be able to keep building Christ's church in this new phase of opposition and loss at such a large scale. But as we're going to see this morning, the answer that Paul gave Timothy is the same answer that God has for us today. Semper Reformanda. Keep reforming according to God's Word. So this morning, keep your fingers nimble. We're going to move at lightning speed over the entire book of 2 Timothy. And as we do, we're going to see four ways, four ways in which going back to the past, going back to God's Word, gives us everything we need to build the future. Four ways in which reforming is the antidote to deconstructing. Christ is building His church. He's doing it through us. The gates of hell shall not prevail against us. So we'll begin in 2 Timothy chapter 1. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit, writes these words. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Father, illumine us. May the same Spirit who authored these words bring them to bear on our hearts and minds and so conform us into the image of Christ. Amen. So how did Paul instruct Timothy to faithfully build Christ's church in an age of deconstructing? First, guard the truth. Guard the truth, the truth of God's Word, the responsibility to study it, to understand it, and then to teach it to others had been entrusted to Timothy just as it had been entrusted to Paul before him. This was Timothy's job, to guard the truth because it would indeed come under attack. Satan has always opposed God's people. In the church age, the last thing he wants is for the gospel to go forth, to have people saved and brought from death to life, to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. He's going to oppose us. He's going to try and remove the truth from us, as it were. And so Timothy must guard the truth. And how does he do this? Two ways. First, by remembering the past. Remembering the past. Verse 5, I'm reminded of your sincere faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now I am sure in you as well. 
Timothy learned the faith from his mother and from his grandmother. Remember, this is only about 30-some-odd years after the day of Pentecost, and some scholars speculate that perhaps Lois and or Eunice may have been in that crowd in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Those blessed women were saved. They were converted to faith in the risen Messiah, Jesus. And they faithfully stewarded that, that truth, and they passed it on to Timothy. And in those 30 years between Lois's day and Timothy's day, the world had already changed so much, and it was on the threshold of changing even more. Under that persecution of Nero and subsequent Roman emperors would intensify. And of course, in the year AD 70, when the city of Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed. So how was Timothy, without Paul and without the other apostles, how was he supposed to faithfully build the church for future generations? By remembering the past. For us today, as Americans, as, as evangelical Reformed Christians in America in the 21st century, too often we lose sight of the past. R.C. Sproul uh, often quipped that too many Americans seem to think that church history began with Billy Graham. But as a result, so many of our, our uh, presuppositions, our assumptions about life and reality and about God's Word, how to understand it and apply it, so often our understandings of these things don't actually come from God's Word itself, but rather from our culture. Because we breathe a certain air, don't we? Living in the times and the culture and the country that we do. We don't even realize most of the time that so many of the things we tend to take as settled dogma, what we think are absolute truths about what we believe about the way the world is, often those things don't come from God's Word, but they come from the culture. In America, post 9-11, for example. Or because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Or because of the, the creation of the United Nations after World War II. Or the death of Imperial Europe in 1918. Or the Industrial Revolution. Or the Enlightenment. Or the Renaissance. And back and back and back on and on you can go. These things, these major world events, influence us in ways we don't even understand, beloved. That's why it's so important to always be going back to Scripture. Because it doesn't change. It's also why it's so important to read old books, by the way. C.S. Lewis said that reading old books was the best defense against us becoming entrenched in our own chronological snobbery. Because the people of the past, Lewis said, were no cleverer than we are now. They made as many mistakes, but they made different mistakes. They made different errors than we commit now, and so we'll be able to recognize them and so recognize our own errors more readily. So read old books. If you're a theology student, read modern theology books. Of the making of books, there is no end. Believe me, I know. That's true. It was true 2,000 years ago. It's true now. But read works that are being made now and then go back and read what works influence them and then go back and read what works influence them. Read the, read, uh, go back to the Reformation and read Calvin and Luther and all the rest and then read what they read, Aquinas and Augustine and all the rest. If you're not a theology student, that's okay. You don't have to read uh, difficult works of theology, but read old books from the past. Read biographies of people from the past. Read biographies of great men like uh, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, of great rulers like Charlemagne and Alfred the Great, of the Reformers like Calvin and Luther. Join us on Sunday nights as we study through Pilgrim's Progress, which is published about 350 years ago. Lewis said we need to do this to keep the clean sea breeze of the centuries blowing through our minds and shatter the ungodly lenses of our modern age. We need to honor the fathers and mothers of generations past and steward the legacy they passed down to us. God told the prophet Jeremiah, stand by the road and look. Ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. The ancient paths show us ways that we have long since forgotten ways that we have often failed to steward from our forefathers and our posterity what will bless us if we recover those old ways. Do what it takes to let God's Word become the lens through which you see the world and shake off that tendency to let the world become the lens through which you read God's Word. Guard the truth by remembering the past. Well, second, we guard the truth by standing boldly. Standing boldly. Back in verses 6-8. through eight, he said, fan into flame the gift of God. God gave us a spirit of, not, not of fear, but of power and love and, and self-control. That may also be translated as sound mind. 
The discipline to train your mind in God's Word. And that in turn gives your mind its shape and its structure and its control. Do not be ashamed. It would have been easy for Timothy to be ashamed of his own timidity, to be ashamed of his mentor, old and frail, now imprisoned and facing execution. It would have been easy for Timothy to back off from the confrontational nature of the Gospel to protect himself and protect his family from persecution. But Paul says, no, that's not the way. That's not what you were called to do. That's not the truth that you're guarding, Timothy. That's not the fruit that the Gospel of Jesus Christ produces in His people. Stand boldly. That's a temptation for us, isn't it? When we face all the opposition from every side that we face in our world today, it it can be tempting to back off, to sit down, to shut up, to minimize the inherently offensive nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's offensive to sinners because we want to protect ourselves, we want to protect our jobs, our income, our families, our health. It'd be easy to just lie down, go to sleep, ignore the foundations being destroyed, deconstruction happening all around us, but how would that build Christ's church? How would that affect our children, our grandchildren, generations who are yet far off? What kind of legacy will we leave for them if we simply sit down and shut up? Guard the truth by standing boldly. The second way Paul instructed Timothy to faithfully build the church is to be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 1. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the Lord, faithfully building Christ's church, always reforming according to God's Word. It takes courage. It takes strength. How was Timothy to demonstrate his godly strength and courage then? Three ways. First, by entrusting others with the truth. Chapter 2, verse 2. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. How are we supposed to pass this on? And trust others? Who will entrust others? Paul, what about Nero? What about the entire Roman world who thinks we're fanatical seditionists? And trust God's truth to others who will be able to pass it on in their time. No matter what the world looks like in our day, our charge is the same. Make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey Christ. Pass on the faith to others. Teach your children. Teach your grandchildren. Nurture them in the teaching and the discipline of the Lord. Whether you live in America in 2023 or Rome in AD 67, our charge and our responsibility is the same. Be strong in the Lord and trust others with the truth. Second, we are to be strong in the Lord by enduring suffering. By enduring suffering. Verse 3, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And then in the next several verses, Paul uses the metaphors of a soldier and an athlete and a farmer of how to diligently work hard and endure suffering. Remember, Jesus himself told his disciples they should expect to suffer. Why? Because he suffered. The world hated him, and so the world is going to hate us as well. If we're faithfully following him, if we're living out our faith in every aspect of our life as he commanded, it's going to happen. They're going to hate us. But we still have to work hard like a soldier, like an athlete to win the prize, like a farmer to grow the crop, entrusting the results to God. Because Caesar is not Lord, Jesus is. Be strong in the Lord by enduring suffering. Third, we are to be strong in the Lord by rightly handling Scripture. Rightly handling Scripture. Verse 15 of chapter 2. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. This is a charge to Pastor Timothy, yes, but it's also a charge to every single Christian, not just pastors. Pastors and teachers have a greater responsibility, yes. Every Christian, though, must strive to handle God's God's word rightly because we're all going to be held accountable to God for how we handle his word. We don't have the freedom to tamper with it. What happens if we don't handle God's Word rightly? What happens if we do just let people do whatever they want and twist it like Martin Luther said into a wax nose to justify any and all kind of sin? Paul has something to say about that. Verse 16, Avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness and their talk will spread like gangrene. 
gangrene, false teaching, wrongly handling God's Word. It rots us away from the inside out, individually and institutionally. That was happening in Paul's day. It's been a scourge in the visible church for uh, the last 2,000 years. It's nothing new, but our responsibility is the same. Be strong in the Lord by rightly handling Scripture. That brings us to the third way in which Paul instructed Timothy to faithfully build the church, and that is to be faithful to God's Word. Be faithful to God's Word. Now, this might seem obvious. might seem like what we just said, but the church of Christ in every age has had to struggle to maintain faithfulness to God's Word or to reform themselves back into faithfulness to God's Word. And again, that's due to our own sinful tendencies to drift. Like the hymn writer said, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. That's all of us, individually and corporately. So two specific ways that we are to strive to be faithful to God's Word. First, by resisting cultural pressure. Resisting cultural pressure. Chapter 3, verse 1. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Do any of those things sound like what we see in our day? Paul says that in the last days these things will happen, but we've been living in the last days ever since Jesus ascended back to the Father. We live in an age of deconstruction. We live in a, in a world, and especially in, in our nation, the United States, where there is massive cultural pressure to sit down and shut up, to tone it down, keep it to yourself, keep it in, in the privacy of your own home, dull that sharp edge of the gospel, stop insisting on a biblical sexual ethic. That's a massive one in our day. To recontextualize what the Bible says about marriage, gender, sexuality, because it's hard. It makes people feel bad. And that pressure isn't just coming from the world, from those who openly admit to not being believers in Christ. No, it's coming from within the visible church, people who claim to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. The call is coming from inside the house. The PCA, which is the conservative Presbyterian denomination in the U.S., they've been fighting an internal battle over this for several years now. There's a movement called Revoice, which claims that same-sex desires are not inherently sinful, and the church ought to be welcoming of so-called same-sex attracted individuals, not as sinners in need of repentance and healing that can only be found in Jesus Christ, but as fully validated participants with those sinful desires in the life of the church. And if you ever listen to any of their talks or read their blogs and books, beloved, prepare to defend yourself. Prepare to guard that truth in your own heart because the lengths that these people will go to and the, the, the hermeneutical gymnastics they will perform, the unashamed twisting and distorting they do of God's Word in order to justify and rationalize away sin, sin that keeps people from Jesus Christ, is very subtle. The world doesn't want people to hear the truth of the Gospel. Satan doesn't want people to be liberated from their sin by the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Hearing the gospel is the means by which God has decreed that sinful people are saved, that dead people are brought to life. It's simple as that. And so what better way then to get rid of the offense of the gospel than to put on massive societal pressure from every angle, like a pressure cooker? To even infiltrate churches and to, and to put on a veneer of, of nice behavior of friendly relationships, societal acceptability, academic credibility. By the way, I'm sure Derek Webb would take it as a badge of honor that I'm talking about him this morning in little old St. James Church in Louisville, Kentucky. 
If he knew, he'd probably just smugly and, and fake humbly brag about it on social media, as he tends to do. Webb uh, himself stopped pretending to be a Christian after a while, but his latest album, those songs I mentioned earlier, it's being marketed as his return to Christian and gospel music. They're ravenous wolves dressed in sheep's clothing, and they're looking to devour the sheep. Be faithful to God's Word by resisting cultural pressure. And second, be faithful to God's Word by submitting to its authority. Submit to its authority. There's plenty of smart and educated people out there who study God's Word, but are completely devoid of the Holy Spirit within, devoid of love for Christ. People who refuse then to submit to its authority. Chapter 3 and verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There's another call to endure suffering. Verse 13, evil people and imposters, the thing about imposters is you don't know they're imposter at first. They will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived as another exhortation to resist cultural pressure. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. There's another reminder to guard the truth by remembering the past. Verse 16, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All Scripture... Every word, every jot, every tittle, the tiniest pen strokes the authors used to write it down from Genesis to Revelation is breathed out by God. The word there in the Greek is theopneustos. Theo, God, neustos, breath or spirit. It's breathed out. We often talk about the doctrine of the inspiration of Scripture, but by that we don't mean that the Bible is a collection of writings of men who were just thinking about God and inspired to write stuff down about Him like an artist who was sitting at the beach and looking out over this beautiful seascape and said, wow, that's beautiful. I think I'll paint a picture. It's not what we mean by the inspiration of Scripture. A better term would actually be the expiration of Scripture because expiration means to breathe out. (laughs) Literally, the very words of the Bible are breathed out by God and because God Himself breathed out the words of Scripture through the Holy Spirit written down by the pen of the pens of His human authors, the words of Scripture carry the very authority of God Himself. We still read it and interpret it according to its various genres, its authorial intents, but unless we submit to its authority, we are not being faithful to God's Word. So we be faithful to God's Word by submitting to its authority authority the fourth and final way that paul exhorts timothy in this letter to faithfully build christ's church even in an age of deconstruction preach the word preach the word this is a command to pastors and teachers and all who aspire to the office of overseer yes but just like that command to handle god's word rightly this command also applies in some sense to all christians because all of us not just me as your pastor All of us, as the people of God, are charged with proclaiming the good news of the gospel to all around us. I've said it before and I'll say it again, that the rest of you have opportunities and relationships that I could never have as a pastor. Even if you're not standing up here in a pulpit preaching, you're still to be living for Christ, to telling others about Him in word and in deed. So how do we build the church by preaching the word? Two ways. First, remember the charge. We preach the word by remembering the charge. Chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. That's another reminder to resist cultural pressure too, isn't it? No matter how bleak the future may look, no matter the opposition we're facing, no matter how weak and timid we ourselves may feel, we build Christ's church by remembering the charge that our Lord Jesus Himself gave to us. 
It is his church. It is his word. It is his gospel. It is his love and his mercy and his grace that we bring to the world. This is the message that we proclaim to all nations. Jesus Christ came into the world. Why? To save sinners. No matter what enemies may array themselves against us, we're called to faithfully steward His message. Remain faithful to Him. Jesus Christ, crucified, dead, buried, risen again in power and victory, ascended to the right hand of the Father so that all who come to Him and Him alone in repentance and faith, male and female, Jew and Greek, slave and free, will be forgiven their sins and given His righteousness and given life, true life, both now and for all eternity in the blessedness of His presence. That's the one whose message we proclaim. I know whom I have believed, Paul said. Preach the word by remembering the charge. And second, we preach the word by looking to the future. We remember the past and we preach the word by looking to the future. Verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul's labor is almost complete. The time of suffering is almost past. His reward is very soon. He can feel it. He can almost taste it. The reward of life and resurrection and that beatific vision of God's unveiled presence. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. When He comes, His reward to His people who have endured, His people who have stood fast in the evil day, His people who have faithfully labored to build His church, even if the world around them is being deconstructed, His reward to them is the crown of righteousness. No matter what the world throws at us, we can endure because His reward is infinitely and eternally better. Christ is infinitely better. He is building His church and He's doing it through the faithfulness of His saints. What a glorious privilege that is for us. By His Word, by His Spirit, and as He promised, He will build His church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do you want to hear His commendation on that day, beloved? Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful. Now enter into the joy of your Master. Guard the faith. Be strong in the Lord. Be faithful to God's Word. Preach the Word. I want to leave you with this quote. It's a lengthy quote. It's from another faithful man of God who faced difficulties and deconstruction in his day. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great English preacher. He squared off against the Anglican Church over the issue of baptismal regeneration in the 1870s. And then in the last several years of his ministry, he stood nearly alone in England in what we call the downgrade controversy, in which preachers all over England were downplaying the offense of the gospel, even to the point of denying central tenets of the Christian faith, such as the penal substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ, the inspiration and authority of Scripture, the deity of Jesus Christ. And over against that downgrade, as the world was being deconstructed, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, in his sermon, Holding Fast the Faith, from February 5, 1888, he stood boldly and faithfully, reforming according to God's word against the rampant deconstruction of his age. He said this, We must defend the faith, for what would have become of us if our fathers had not maintained it? If confessors, reformers, martyrs, and covenanters had been recreant to the name and faith of Jesus, where would have been the churches of today? Must we not play the man as they did? If we do not, are we not censuring our fathers? It is very pretty, is it not, to read of Luther and his brave deeds? Of course, everybody admires Luther. Yes, yes, but you do not want anyone else to do the same today. When you go to the zoo, you all admire the bear, but how would you like a bear at home or a bear wandering loose in the streets? You tell me that it would be unbearable. It's a nice bear pun from Spurgeon. No doubt you're right. So we admire a man who was firm in the faith, say, 400 years ago, 500 years ago. The past ages are a sort of bear pit or an iron cage for that man. But such a man today we call a nuisance. 
he must be put down. We call him a narrow-minded bigot. Sounds familiar to us today, doesn't it? Or we give him a worse name if you can think of one. Yet imagine in those ages past, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, and their compeers had said, the world is out of order, but if we try to set it right, we shall only make a great row and get ourselves into disgrace. Let us go to our chambers and put on our nightcaps and sleep over the bad times, and perhaps when we wake up, things will have grown better. Such conduct on their part would have entailed upon us a heritage of error. Age after age would have gone down into the infernal deeps, and the pestiferous bogs of error would have swallowed all. These men loved the faith and the name of Jesus too well to see them trampled on. Note what we owe them, and let us pay to our sons the debt we owe our fathers. Spurgeon continues, and this quote is just as true in our day as it is in his day. It is today as it was in the Reformers' days. Decision is needed. Here is the day for the man. Where is the man for the day? We who have had the gospel passed to us by martyr hands dare not trifle with it, nor sit by and hear it denied by traitors who pretend to love it, but inwardly abhor every line of it. The faith I hold bears upon it the marks of the blood of my ancestors. Shall I deny their faith? for which they left their native land to sojourn here? Shall we cast away the treasure which was handed to us through the bars of prisons or came to us charred through the flames? When I think of how others have suffered for the faith, a little scorn or unkindness towards myself seems a mere trifle, not even worthy of mention. An ancestry of lovers of the faith ought to be a great plea with us to abide by the Lord God of our fathers. The faith in which they lived. As for me, I must hold the old gospel. I can do no other. God help me. I will endure the consequences of what men think is obstinacy. Look you, sirs, there are ages yet to come. If the Lord does not speedily appear, there will come another generation, and another, and another, and all these generations yet to come will be tainted and injured if we are not faithful to God and to His truth today. We have come to a turning point in the road. If we turn to the right, mayhap our children and our children's children will go that way. But if we turn to the left, generations yet unborn will curse our names for having been unfaithful to God and to His Word. I charge you, not only by your ancestry, but by your posterity, that you seek to win the commendation of your Master. That even though you dwell where Satan's seat is, yet you hold fast his name, the name of Jesus Christ, and do not deny his faith. It was true in Paul's day. It was true in Luther's day. It was true in Spurgeon's day. And it's true in our day now, beloved. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The answer, the only answer, The only way to faithfully build Christ's church in an age where everything is being deconstructed. The only way to have any hope for the future. The only way to be faithful to our Lord and to do everything we can to guard that good deposit that has been entrusted to us by faithful men and faithful women of the past and by our Lord Jesus Christ Himself to equip future generations to keep on building Christ's church against the very gates of hell. The only answer The only hope is to be always reforming according to God's Word. Let's pray. Father, we are all too aware of our own sinful tendency to drift away from You and Your Word. Thank You for Your faithfulness to us even when we are unfaithful to You because of Your unchanging character and Your steadfast love. Thank You for that promise given from our Lord Jesus that He will build His church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Thank you for this amazing and glorious privilege you've given us, your people, your church, to be the means by which your kingdom is spread and your church building itself up into a a holy temple to the Lord. Father, we live in uncertain days, but may we not shrink back from the task that you have set set before us, but trust that you have placed us here for such a time as this. May the daunting nature of those forces that are arrayed against us cause us not to fear, but to stand boldly to fight the good fight of faith with joy because we know that in Christ the victory is already won. 
There is nothing that is impossible for you, God, so help us to be faithful. Help us to guard what we have been entrusted with and to faithfully pass it on to future generations that they too may build your church no matter what opposition they may face in their day. We pray these things in Jesus' glorious name and for the sake of his kingdom. Amen.